latest film in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise has dropped on Netflix. So today we're gonna stop and rank the franchise that started with a simple drive down FM 685 in Texas. Wait, FM 685 in Texas? That's near my house. Where do I live? Hi, my name is Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. My list isn't the right list, it's just my list and I would love to see yours. As we go into this, I got a little bit of a confession for you. I'd never seen any of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre films until last month, January 2022. And so as I go into this, I am brand new to the franchise. So that's my perspective as I rank these. But also, I grew up and live in the area where most of these films were shot. So I shot portions of this ranking at actual shooting locations for the films that I will be talking about. And I made a little vlog about some of those places that I visited. You can check that out right up here once this video is over with and let's get started. Coming in in last place is Leatherface, and I thought that this movie was a complete and total misfire. I can appreciate that they wanted to do something a little bit different and explore the Leatherface character, but not every single character needs a tragic origin story. And in fact, trying to make me feel bad and sympathy for a chainsaw serial killer might be putting the focus in the wrong place. Beyond that, it feels like they took a generic road trip horror film about people escaping an insane asylum and tried to convert it into a Texas Chainsaw Massacre film because it's an established brand and they thought it would do better as a movie in a franchise, but it doesn't match the vibe of any of the other films in the franchise. The twist turn about who's actually Leatherface is so blatantly obvious where things are headed from the very beginning, where they're like, we give everybody different names, and there's the one that seems very much like Leatherface, and the person that's the character that we're following it's pretty obvious where all of this is heading. Likewise, the idea that the police knew about this Sawyer family farm 19 years before the original film makes absolutely no sense. And that's the big problem here. This origin does not fit the character or the franchise at all, in which case this is just a classic example of a prequel answering questions I was not asking with really bad answers that only hurt the mythology. So I thought that this one did not fit, it did not work, so it comes in in last place. Number eight, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation. Now, to be fair, I think that Leatherface is maybe a more competently made film than Next Generation, but I think this movie has just enough more personality because you do have an insane Matthew McConaughey in it to elevate it above Leatherface. But when it comes to this movie, immediately, everything feels a little bit off, everything feels a little bit cheaper, and there's no shortage of ideas here that are just absolutely bonkers insane. I mean, like, while I was watching this movie, there was a number of times where I thought my internet was slowing down and that was causing the image to blur a little bit. And then I remembered, no, I'm watching a Blu-ray right now. The image is just out of focus in the original master for the film. That's a really bad sign when all of the shots aren't even in focus. Beyond that, there's just some really bizarre ideas to introduce into the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. We have elements of like the Illuminati and is there this shadow organization that's actually behind this insane family that Leatherface is a part of? I mean, these are just bad ideas. They're so bad that they're ridiculous and they do loop back around and become entertaining again in a way that once again Leatherface didn't do but they're terrible insane ideas to the best of my ability I'm at the shooting location of the pizza place in Texas Chainsaw Massacre the next generation it's also rush hour right now and they've changed some location so it's a little bit tricky but you can see the HEB in the background 
So this is an interesting movie because it's just so bonkers. There's a lot of things about it that are wildly incompetent <laughs> with the way that it was shot, the way that it was written, the amount of budget that they had, but it just leans so hard into the insanity that it's tough not to have a lot of fun with it. And you have a very young Matthew McConaughey giving it his all and giving a full-blown Nicolas Cage performance. <laughs> This is a bad movie that is poorly made on technical levels. But it's so weird, it's so crazy, that there is a little bit of entertainment value mixed in at the same time. All right, there's not really a place to stop, but that is the house from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation. Next up, Texas Chainsaw 3D. And this is where I feel like the franchise just completely lost the plot. Not every character works well as an anti-hero and not every franchise and premise is a particularly good vehicle to tell an anti-mob justice story. And so this is a movie that plays very weird as it tries to use Leatherface as a vehicle to battle the corrupt police. He is not the right character to do that. This does not fit well. It doesn't feel right and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It feels kind of gross to, if you stop and think about what this plot line is implying, especially in light of the original film and like that the family from the original film were the victims in a sense. That's not a good idea for a Texas Chainsaw Massacre sequel. With all that said, because you do have Alexandra Daddario, Scott Eastwood thrown into the mix, you have enough star power, there's enough budget and production value to make it watchable, and as terrible of an idea as it is to turn Leatherface into an anti-hero, it is a lot of fun when you get to the end of the movie to have Alexandra Daddario going, Do your thing, cuz. Having Leatherface then pick up a chainsaw and start battling the evil cops. Sure, it's a terrible moment. It's a stupid moment. But it is a fun moment at the exact same time. There's a bunch of wacky, goofy 3D effects with the chainsaw swinging at the screen that's funny to watch when you're watching it in 2D. Is some of it entertaining? Sure. Is it good? No. Is it a terrible premise for a Texas Chainsaw Massacre film? Yeah, it's pretty terrible, and it's really tone deaf in light of what so much of this represented and how terrible it is that there's a character that chainsaws people to death and is being presented here as an anti-hero. Number six, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Beginning. And to me, this felt like the most mainstream of the films in the franchise, and I would say that is not a good thing. And what I mean by that is like in the first 10 minutes of the movie, you have two of the characters hooking up while a classic rock song is playing. And then as we get into the actual meat of the story, the event that kicks everything off is the fact that a biker gang is tracking down our lead characters and Mad Max style causes them to get into a car accident. And that's all before the lunatic cannibal chainsaw wielding lunatics show up. And that feels like classic mainstream horror films and franchise films where they just feel like they have to elevate every single thing to where Leatherface isn't interesting enough, so we have to add all this over-the-top stuff even before Leatherface shows up. From there, it has the classic prequel problem where, as I mentioned earlier in this video, it's trying to answer questions I wasn't asking with answers I do not care about. Did you ever want to see Leatherface's birth? Ever wonder how the sheriff got his job? Ever wonder how the guy in the wheelchair lost his legs? Ever wonder how the sheriff lost his front teeth? Me neither. But now I know. Likewise, at this point in time in the franchise, they're treating Leatherface just like He's Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers. All of the distinctives of the characterization in the previous films feels like it's all gone and he's just a masked character that's big, bulking, brooding, and has a distinct weapon that he uses, just like Jason, 
just like Michael, except this time it's Leatherface and the quirkiness, the weirdness, all of that stuff is gone and he's just killer guy. And so much like with a Texas Chainsaw 3D, it's well produced. It does have a really good cast. Pretty much all the movies on this have a pretty good cast, actually. So it's watchable. It's fun to see Leatherface doing his thing. Arlie Emery, always fun to see on screen. But it feels a little bit like they've lost their way and we're just kind of going through the motions delivering another one of these movies. So we are at the house for both Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2003 as well as Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Beginning. And this is a fun one because they are open to you filming from the street, but they've got like big signs everywhere saying, do not trespass. They have security cameras making sure you don't go on their property at all. In fifth place, Leatherface, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this franchise to me is that while the basic premise of almost all of these films is basically the same, they feel very different from one another. The original was this just vi visceral, gritty film. The second one was almost or kind of self-parody. And then you get to the third film, and this feels like a movie heavily influenced by the slashers of that time period. Feels like they tried to turn Texas Chainsaw Massacre into a, a Friday the 13th film just a little bit with the way that it's structured. And while I don't think it's great, I actually kind of dug what they did with this movie. The setup is still pretty straightforward, but it's just layered enough to add a bit more intrigue into the mix. I liked that they added a character into the mix who would actually be useful in this situation with Benny, who's this survivalist training for these types of situations, who has some supplies and elements that would make him someone that could fight back and thus does so in the story. I liked a lot of those elements to the film. Of course, it's just fun to see a young Viggo Mortensen in a role like this, a very different film than what you'd expect from him. And so that's just kind of fun to see. And they brought some elements in that are kind of unsettling with the bringing the, the kid that you think is a victim and it turns out, nope, just a willing member of the family and finding one more way to make the family uh, get under your skin and come off creepy in a new sense. At the same time, because it is a Texas Chainsaw Massacre film that feels like it's trying to be like a Friday the 13th or maybe a Halloween film from that time period, it also comes off pretty generic in a lot of ways. And that genericness you feel throughout the entire production because the feel of it like a lot of other movies from that time period because it's a Texas Chainsaw Massacre film but it was shot in California even the look of it doesn't really look like Texas they're trying to make California look like Texas so they tried to find the most generic looking place that could pass for Texas in which case it's pretty boring looking and it doesn't really look all that much like Texas and so it's a movie that I found to be watchable. I dug it. I, I was into this movie, but at the same time, very forgettable. Maybe the most forgettable of the movies on this list besides Vigo being in the film because it is just kind of generic and it's not bad enough or weird enough to be interesting or good enough to stand out. And I'll say this, the movies at the bottom of this list feel like they just lost the premise entirely. And this movie feels like a studio making a by the numbers addition to the franchise. They took this indie, on location, gritty series and made a generic genre film. And you feel that all throughout the production. In fourth place, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. The video cover for this movie tells you just about everything you need to know about the film as it's a parody of the cover of The Breakfast Club. This is a movie that's very difficult to process as you're watching it for the first time because it is such a jarring tonal shift from the original film that it just feels like it comes completely out of nowhere from the very beginning of the movie. It's like you're watching something totally different and I didn't fully acclimate to what I was watching until about halfway through the film and could take it for all of its campy goodness. Uh, it's a movie where clearly 
Hooper knew what he wanted to deliver, what he was trying to do with this film. And I don't know if I, as an audience member, was ready for it at the beginning of the film, but by the time Dennis Hopper was standing on a table wielding two chainsaws, battling Leatherface, I started getting on board with the film and understanding what I was watching. This is a bananas movie that's poking fun at itself, poking fun at the all the movies that it inspired, and poking fun at horror fans. Well delivering a bunch of horror goodness at the same time. It is bananas, it is gleefully weird, and that's what I enjoyed about this film. I wasn't fully into it, really, until it moved into the third act, when I started being like, this is so insane, I, I am eating this up, and it made me reinterpret everything I'd watched in the first half and enjoy it more. And while the story and production are much larger, it's just as straightforward when it comes to the actual narrative. And also, while the movie is very goofy, it's also really intense at times, which makes for an odd mix because it's not really scary, but it does get your heart pounding. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to join me down below in the comment section. Let me know your ranking of this series. Also, there is that vlog companion video that goes along with it. You can check that out right up here when this video is done, where I kind of spent more time talking about each of the locations, giving some backstory, that sort of thing, and just my experience visiting all the sites. And if you enjoyed this video, I've done a ton of other horror rankings just like this one, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Scream, Conjuring, all that fun stuff and much more. You can check them out also in this playlist right up here. In third place, the new one, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now, I went into this movie not really knowing what to expect. I didn't really follow the production of the film. I didn't watch the trailers for it. I just pushed play, watched the movie, and I thoroughly enjoyed what they delivered. And maybe it's because I like these Fede Alvarez horror thrillers, uh, whether he directs them or comes up with a story or just produces them. I like what he delivers and the way that he does these types of stories. And I guess these kind of close quarters movies about people trying to survive and fighting back that's my thing. This movie, not as weird and strange as the original film, much more mainstream and about the thrills. It's not so much about a run for your life, it's much more about fight for your life, but I was eating it up. And a big part of that is the movie does really good setup and payoff, whether simple little plot lines about one of our lead characters having survived a mass shooting and having certain holdups about guns and just putting the right pieces in place about the city they're in, being it in Texas, Texas being one of the most pro-gun states in the United States, I just thought that was all handled really nicely, that it's not like a big character arc with transformation, but it's the right little character arc for the movie that we're watching to pay off nicely. And then of course you just get plenty of Leatherface mayhem where they put the massacre in Texas Chainsaw Massacre in the last half of this film where he just tears up a bus full of people. There's a huge body count, plenty of nasty gore, but also plenty of people fighting back against him in a way that I thought worked really nicely. It's not a classic of the genre. It's not the most memorable horror, fi horror film. Certainly they cheated at times where they wanted to deliver a visual that doesn't necessarily make the most logical sense with what's happening. But the experience, the thrills, the satisfaction of the payoff, I enjoyed what they do with this film. And I even like the way they did the legacy elements of bringing Sally back. And she's not like a major character, but she's an important part of the story. And she fleshes out the mythology of like, what if something like that did happen 50 years ago? How would that be remembered? I thought it was really well done. I think this is one of the best films in the franchise as someone that's new to the franchise. Our runner up, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2003. I think this is a great example of how a remake doesn't have to be in competition with the original. On paper, these movies have the same basic setup plot, but in the execution, it's wildly different. One of them, low budget, gritty. The other one, slick, well-produced, and both of them do a great job of what they're trying to do. And I think each of them delivered a unique film with the same plot, 
but both of them are effective at what they were going for. The movie has a great cast of people that were well-known, but not A-listers at the time the movie came out, and many of them have continued to have careers since the movie that came out, and the movie had a big enough budget to use them properly and set up these bigger scenarios than they could have done in the original film that have thrills. There's enough production value to enjoy the moment, get you at the edge of your seat, have some spectacle, while at the same time not losing the franchise, not losing the premise. It feels small. It is about this weird, wild family, but... There's the budget to really play that out differently than they could with the original film. Of course, it's nice to have like R. Lee Emery in the film who just plays this horrifying character as this cop that you think is there to help them and turns out to maybe be the craziest movie in the person in the entire movie and makes you feel even more in danger that you do not know who you can trust. And just a great little addition. He's perfectly insane. His scene in the car with the gun where the guy puts it in his mouth so tense and effective. Maybe it's not as groundbreaking as the original film, but it's a great example of how sometimes remakes can complement the film that they're remaking and reimagine them in a way where they bring something new to the table without being in competition. So I'm at the Slaughterhouse from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2003. And one of the fun things about this movie is that I'd never seen it before, but my wife, who hates slasher films and hates horror movies, especially ones like this that are gritty and nasty and have lots of people being tortured to death, had seen it multiple times, and she was surprised I hadn't seen it, and I was shocked that she had. So she actually wanted to watch this one with me. But coming in in first place, the original, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a classic example of indie horror, and a movie that while I watched it for the very first time just about a month ago, is still incredibly effective 50 years later. Now, some of that might be because I'm biased because I grew up and live right around where the movie was shot. So I'm standing in front of the original location of the Sawyer house. Now in the late 90s, they actually up and moved the original house about 50 miles from here and it's a tourist location you can go and visit. It's filled with memorabilia and fun stuff. But this is where they actually shot the movie and it's virtually unrecognizable at this point in time because over the last 25 years, they've developed all of this out. And there's just some novelty to seeing all these familiar places that look totally different at the exact same time. But a lot of that is because they just did a great job of delivering an unsettling experience from beginning to end. Just when the characters are talking at the start of the film, it's, it's unnerving as they're describing slaughterhouses and then they bring in this hitchhiker who's celebrating and gleefully discussing all the stuff that creeped me out just moments earlier. And the movie, I didn't know what to expect going into it. I expected Leatherface, but I didn't expect the family dynamic where they sit down for dinner and <laughs> it's the most bonkers thing you've ever seen where there's this old man and they're trying to get him to use a hammer to smash someone's head. It's so weird and non-mainstream that it just messes with you on this whole other level than what modern day mainstream popular horror films are able to do. Likewise, it was such a grassroots production where you could just see the sweat on their faces. And that's what makes this movie so special is while it is a horror classic, it's nothing like any of the horror films that come out today that are just so slick and well produced. This was a raw, brutal production and you see that in every single frame. It, none of it feels like sets because it wasn't sets. They were in real places. People were actually smashing through windows and rolling on broken glass. So it comes in at number one. If you enjoyed this video, I've got more like it right over there where you can check out my other horror rankings. And right down there, you've got that vlog with all of my experiences visiting the, shoot visiting the shooting locations. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.